don't think the murderers of Ohio on YouTube. Murderers of Ohio is a true crime podcast that can be found on Spotify, Google, Apple, or iHeartRadio. And basically wherever else you can get your podcast. The audio that you're about to hear is from season two from the podcast about Reverend Gerald Robertson, who is convicted of killing a nun. I have to say that this is probably one of the few cases where I think that an innocent man actually died in prison. So I hope you enjoy. Please hit that like and share button and subscribe to Murders in Ohio right here on YouTube. The convicted murders that I have talked about so far for this project, I feel all have been guilty. This is the first convicted murderer who I believe might have been innocent and unfortunately died in prison. I am Bill Swafford and this is Murder. So we got a killer on a run at Ohio. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Murderers in Ohio. This episode will have a lot to do with ties to the Roman Catholic Church, Satanism, accused child rape, murder of a nun, and the priest who was convicted of the murder. This case is out of Toledo in Lucas County, Ohio. Lucas County is in the northwest part of Ohio and the county sits by Lake Erie. Toledo is west of Cleveland, Ohio. Toledo is a decent sized city. In the year of 1980, there was a hospital called Toledo Mercy Hospital. The hospital is no longer in Toledo. It has since then been turned into a college. At the Toledo Mercy Hospital, there was a chapel within this hospital. This chapel was ran by priests and nuns from the Roman Catholic Church. I will have to say that I am not Catholic and I do not understand a lot of what they do. I was brought up in a Southern Baptist church, which is different than a Catholic church. A priest by the name of Reverend Gerald Robertson was stationed at the Toledo Mercy Hospital. The Catholic Church Diocese is in charge of where the priests are stationed at. Gerald was thin and clean shaved. He had short dark hair. Gerald was known to be quiet and would often keep to himself. Gerald's mom was heavily involved with the church. He had gone through a life of religious studies. Gerald became an official ordained priest at the age of 26 years old. And shortly after that, he would be placed at the Toledo Mercy Hospital by the church. Gerald ministered to the sick and dying at nursing homes and at the hospital and would eventually retire after three parishes. Reverend Gerald had faithful followers in his hometown of Toledo, where he delivered his sermons and took confessions in Polish. In the 1980s, Gerald would have been in his early to mid-40s. Reverend Gerald had given his life to the Catholic Church. On April 4th, 1980, Reverend Gerald Robinson would give the Good Friday Sermon at the chapel in the hospital. The Good Friday Sermon usually takes a while. However, for some reason, Gerald had cut the sermon short. This did not sit well with everyone at the hospital. There was one nun who had made it known that she was not happy about Gerald cutting the Good Sermon short. This would be 71-year-old sister Margaret Ann Paul. I don't know if I pronounced that last name correctly or not, but it is spelled P-A-H-L. The sister kept to the rules of the Catholic Church, and she expected everyone else to do so also. The sister was the caretaker of the chapel. She also helped the sick and dying. Sister Margaret was skinny with long gray hair. She wore black glasses. She was born in 1909. 1909. She grew up in a family that was deep in the Catholic Church. At the age of 19 years old and fresh out of high school, Margaret became a Sister of Mercy. Years later, she would become a registered nurse. She had thought about retirement because of hearing loss. However, she ended up at the Toledo Mercy Hospital. 
It is said that Sister Margaret was not liked by Reverend Gerald because the sister was very strict about how things should be done. It does sound like Sister Margaret is what some would call old school, someone who did not like a lot of changes in their routine. On Saturday, April 5th of 1980, Sister Margaret would wake up early and have breakfast. The sister was going to get the chapel ready for the next day, Sunday, which was Easter Sunday, and also the sister's 72nd birthday. After Sister Margaret had her breakfast, she had gone to the chapel. An hour or two later, who worked at the hospital sat down in the hospital cafeteria to start their breakfast. The two officers would not be able to none would come running into the cafeteria and yelling for help. The young nun would tell the two officers that she had gone to the chapel and discovered a body in a small room in the chapel. The two officers took off running to the chapel. I want you to remember this next part. A witness has said that while the officers were running to the chapel, the two priests would catch up with the officers. The four of them would go to the chapel. One of those priests is said to be Gerald Robinson. What they had found in the small room of the chapel would be absolutely horrifying. 71-year-old Sister Margaret had been murdered. The killer did more than just kill Sister Margaret, of disrespect to the sister and towards the church. The sister was on the floor. Her habit, or gown, was pulled up to her chest. Her underwear and pantyhose were pulled down to her ankles. She had been strangled and then stabbed. The killer had taken some of the sister's blood and smeared the blood on the sister's forehead as a priest would do when giving a blessing. The blood smear on the sister's forehead was in the shape of an upside-down cross. The coroner would say that the sister was stabbed 31 times in the neck and chest. An altar cloth was placed on the sister's chest. The killer would stab the sister through the altar cloth. Nine of the stab wounds on the sister's chest would form an upside down cross. The coroner also said that the sister had not been raped, but had been penetrated with a cross or something like it. People would say that the upside down crosses represent Satanism, and that this was a satanic act towards the church. An altar cloth is used for the altar of sacrifice. This altar is where the priest turns the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Only a Catholic would know what an altar cloth is used for. I didn't know what one was used for until I looked it up for this episode. An upside down cross is supposed to represent St. Peter who died down. Peter was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Peter was sentenced to death and he requested to be crucified upside down because he felt that he was not worthy to die in the same way of Jesus Christ. The symbol would be used in satanic rituals in the 19th century by a cult leader who claimed to be the reincarnation of a prophet. So the altar cloth, the victim being upside down crosses marked on the victim, and the fact that the murder happened on the day before Easter gave this murder a satanic or cult-like overtone. The murder of Sister Margaret would shock the city of Toledo. Law enforcement would talk to everyone associated with the hospital and chapel. They would search the homes of the priests and nuns. There were 20 nuns working at the hospital at this time. As law enforcement was starting their murder investigation, Sister Margaret's funeral services would be held four days after the murder. Reverend Gerald Robinson would oversee the funeral services. Law enforcement believes that Sister Margaret's habit and underwear were done like they were to disrespect the sister and humiliate her. This would mean that the killer had some kind of problem with Sister Margaret. Witnesses had told law enforcement that Gerald and Margaret had some problems with each other. Reverend Gerald was not pleased with Sister Margaret's strict ways. Then there was the Good Friday sermon that had got cut short. 
Sister Margaret had let Gerald know that she was not happy about Gerald breaking routine and cutting the sermon short. Law enforcement would talk to Gerald Robinson and search Gerald's apartment. Gerald just happened to have an apartment right next door to a Toledo police station. Reverend Gerald did deny having anything to do with the murder of Sister Margaret. When law enforcement searched Gerald's apartment, which was about two weeks after the murder, they would find a sword-like letter opener. It was a letter opener that looked like a pirate sword. A Boy Scout troop had given a letter opener to Gerald. Law enforcement thought it was a possible murder weapon. People have been accused of trying to cover things up. One example would be that of Gerald's early interviews. A deputy police chief had come into the interview and had allowed Gerald to leave. This had upset the detectives who were giving the interview. The deputy police chief was involved with the Catholic Church. It is also said that the same deputy police chief would ask for reports about the case and that some of those reports were never seen again. That sounds like an attempted cover-up in the early stages of the investigation. The first time Gerald was taken to the police station for questioning, another priest had gone with Gerald to the station. This other priest was the son of a police officer. It is said that this priest kept telling Gerald to just tell the truth. Gerald told the detectives that he did not have a key to the room inside of the chapel. The room where Sister Margaret's body was found remained locked and only certain people had the key. Gerald had said that he was in the, that he was in the shower at the time he had received a phone call saying Sister Margaret's body had been found. However, if you remember, the two officers who had run to the chapel and had been joined by the two priests, one of those priests was Gerald Robinson. It is said that the priest was at the chapel and had seen the body. No one noticed anything wrong with the priest. However, had looked cold and aloof after seeing Sister Margaret's body. At some point, Gerald had told the detectives that someone had confessed to murdering the sister, but he could not tell them a name because what he was told had been told to him during a religious confession. Reverend Gerald would be given a lie detector test by law enforcement, which they say he failed. The Catholic Church Diocese would also do a test of their own a couple of weeks after the first test. The church has said the results were inconclusive. The actual test results were never sent to law enforcement. Gerald would later admit to lying about having a key to the room in the chapel also admitted to lying about someone confessing to him about the murder. This did not look good for Gerald. Reverend Gerald Robinson would become law enforcement's number one suspect. Law enforcement would have one problem, though, lack of evidence. They could not arrest Gerald in 1980. So what evidence did law enforcement have? They did find some DNA evidence underneath the sister fingernails. However, this was before anyone really knew the science behind DNA. There was a blonde hair found on the scene. Pictures show the priest with dark colored hair. Some witnesses say they heard footsteps around Gerald's apartment around the time of the murder, which would mean that the priest was at home. Then, there are some witnesses who say that the priest was around the chapel on April 5th, 1980. Detectives always believed that the priest had lied about where he was when Sister Margaret was murdered. Even though law enforcement would believe that Gerald Robinson, a priest, was the killer, they had no evidence against him. The murder investigation of Sister Margaret's death would go cold. Gerald would remain a priest and stay at the hospital chapel for another year after the murder. Then the Catholic Church would transfer Gerald to another location. 
This was a brutal attack on a 71-year-old nun. There was a lot of rage behind this murder. Rage towards Sister Margaret. Or rage against the Catholic Church. Then the possibility that their rage could have been directed towards both the sister personally and the church. The killer would have had the sister's bent. The sister was stabbed 31 times. There would have been a lot of blood. Reverend Gerald would continue to be moved around by the Catholic Church. Detectives never lost track of Gerald. People would start thinking that the Catholic Church was covering things up. People wanted justice for Sister Margaret. The Catholic Church has been known to cover things up. One example would be Catholic priests and young boys. The Catholic Church has many secrets that go back for centuries. In 2003, something would happen that would have nothing to do with this case. However, this would cause detectives to reopen their murder investigation of Sister Margaret. A 42-year-old lady, whose name was never given out to the public, had sent a letter to the Catholic Church diocese. In this letter, the lady had said she was mentally and sexually abused by priests of the church. Sometimes the abuse would happen during satanic rituals held by the priest of the church. One of those priests that the lady had mentioned and was accusing was Reverend Gerald Robinson. She claimed that another priest had paid her father to let Gerald use a whip on her during a sexual act. This went on for years. This lady was wanting $50,000 to be paid by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church would hire two retired police officers to look into what the lady had said. No one knows what those two officers had really discovered. There was a Reverend Cooley who knew about the investigation done by the two retired police officers. This priest insisted that the board turn over what they had discovered to law enforcement. Reverend Cooley was dismissed from the board by the church. Now remember, this lady never meant to crack open a cold case with her letter to the Catholic Church diocese. When the Catholic Church did nothing about what the lady had accused the priest of in the letter, that letter would get sent to the Ohio Attorney General's office. After the first lady had come forward about sexual abuse, several other women would also claim to have been sexually abused by priests. After looking at the letter and some other things, the Ohio Attorney General's office urged Lucas County Sheriff's Department to look into the sexual abuse claims. Lucas County would look into the sexual abuse claims made by the lady in her letter. They were not able to prove or disprove the claims. Even though they got nowhere with the sexual abuse claims, Whatever law enforcement had discovered would make them want to reopen the Sister Margaret case and refocus their investigation on Gerald Robinson, who would at this time be around 66 years old. In 2004, law enforcement would once again search Gerald's home. This search, they would find a book that had to do with Satanism and Satanic rituals. This writing was published by a Catholic group in the 1970s. There were some things underlined in this book, like something referring to a black mass, where the body of an innocent one is used as an altar. Law enforcement did not know if Gerald had gotten this book before or after the murder. Now why this is important is because the black mass where the body of an innocent one is used as an altar would kind of explain why an altar cloth would be placed on top of Sister Mary's body as she was being murdered. I have found out that a lot of priests study Satanism for some reason. I don't understand why they do this. Something like that, even if done with good intentions, 
could play havoc. During the search of Gerald's home in 2004, law enforcement would also find hundreds of photos of dead bodies in coffins. Some of the pictures were very old. This might sound crazy, but some people do collect what is called death photos. Years ago, in some cultures, it was a normal thing to take a photo of a dead person in a coffin as their last photo. Some photos of a famous person could be worth a little bit of money. Detectives thought that the photos represented Gerald's dark side. Sometime in 2004, Reverend Gerald would be arrested for murder. Gerald's murder trial would not start till 2006. So what did law enforcement have against Gerald Robinson, who continued to claim that he was innocent? There is the fact that Gerald lied about having the key to that small room in the chapel. He lied about someone confessing to the murder. Detectives had re-interviewed some witnesses from 1980, who would now place Gerald at the chapel around the time of the murder of Sister Margaret. These new statements that were now being made by the witnesses were not on record in 1980. So did the deputy police chief, the one who had pulled Gerald out of the interview in 1980, did that police chief destroy those statements? A forensic expert said that the sword-like letter had fit into a small hole on Sister Margaret's jaw. This to me means nothing. Any knife can produce a small hole if only the tip of the knife punctures the skin. This wasn't all they had said about the sword-like letter opener. A new study had been developed that looked into blood spatter patterns that were caused by certain objects. It is said that the blood pattern on the altar cloth was left by something like Reverend Gerald's sword-like letter opener. Basically what they're saying is that the blood fell on the altar cloth by the movement of the sword-like letter opener. And they're trying to say that nothing else could make blood fall that way. I do want to remind you, the study of blood spatter patterns is not an exact science. There is plenty of room for error. Detectives believe that they had gotten one more piece of evidence from the letter opener. Apparently, an unknown spot was left on the altar cloth that had been on Sister Margaret's body. Detectives believe that the unknown spot on the altar cloth was left by the handle of the letter opener. I wonder if this was some kind of paint or cleaning oil. I did say that law enforcement did collect DNA from underneath Sister Margaret's fingernails and that a hair was found on the scene. Those things could not be tested in 1980. However, in 2004, they could be. However, in 2004, they could be. We all know DNA as the smoking gun in murder trials. DNA has convicted murderers, and it has helped innocent people be set free. In this case, it did absolutely nothing. A male DNA profile would be created from the evidence. Gerald Robinson would give a DNA sample. This sample would be tested against the evidence. Gerald Robinson's DNA did not match the DNA that was collected at the crime scene. So how did law enforcement handle this? Law enforcement has said that Sister Margaret had likely come into contact with another male before the actual murder. How can this be if the sister had breakfast and then had gone to the chapel to get things ready for the next day's Easter sermon? A male's DNA is not going to get underneath a woman's fingernails unless there is some kind of scratching involved whether it is self-defense or some kind of wild sex. And I believe Sister Margaret, being 71 years old and dedicated to the Lord, was past the days of having wild sex. I could be wrong about that. Who knows? The Catholic Church would refuse to pay Gerald's bail and refuse to help Gerald with legal fees. 
Gerald's bail was set at $200,000. Gerald's faithful church followers tried to raise the bail money and money for legal fees. Reverend Gerald still had faithful followers who believed that he was innocent. But there was some who did believe that there was a chance that he was guilty of murder. Reverend Gerald Robinson's murder trial was in the six. This trial would last for about three weeks. Forty-one witnesses would be brought in to testify. The prosecution pointed out that Gerald did not like Sister Margaret's domineering ways, how strict she was with the rules. Gerald Robinson wore his priest collar for this whole trial. The defense reminded the jury that the DNA that was found at the crime scene did not match that of Gerald Robinson. The prosecution had said that Gerald had pulled up the sister's habit and had pulled down the pantyhose and underwear to make it look as though there was a different motive to the crime. The prosecutor accused the deputy chief of police of trying to cover up the truth about the murder of Sister Margaret because of his ties to the Catholic Church. This would be because of the reports that had gone missing in 1980. Then there would be the police interview, where the deputy police chief comes in, pulls Gerald out of the interview, and allows Gerald to leave, which had upset the detectives that were given the interview. A doctor would testify for the defense. The doctor said that the letter opener did not fit the hole at first, the hole was actually made to fit the letter opener when it had been tested. The doctor had determined this by looking at a picture of the hole in the sister's jaw before the test was done and a picture of the hole after the test was done. Basically what he was saying is that the hole in the jaw in the picture after the test was done was bigger than the hole in the picture that was taken before the test was done. Which means that the sword-like letter opener could possibly not be the murder weapon. The prosecution would bring up a priest by the name of Reverend Jeffrey. Jeffrey's job at the Catholic Church was to study the occult and satanic rituals. It is Reverend Jeffrey's belief that only someone with a professional knowledge of church customs and religious symbols could be the killer someone like a priest or a nun. I would consider this to be a bad witness, or a good witness, however you want to look at it, I guess. Any Catholic would know about the Catholic ways and beliefs. Plus, no matter what a person's religious beliefs are, almost everyone knows that an upside-down cross is associated with Satanism. This testimony that was given by Reverend Jeffrey had people believing that only a priest could have committed this murder. On May 12th of 2006, after six hours of going over the case, the jury would come back with a verdict. Gerald's lawyer would hang his head down as the verdict was read. On May 12th, in a Lucas County Common Pleas courtroom, 68-year-old Reverend Gerald Robinson was found guilty of murder. Gerald was shocked by the verdict. Gerald would be sentenced to 15 years to life in prison, meaning he would have to serve at least 15 years before he was eligible for parole. That means Gerald would be around 83 years old the first time that he'll get a chance to sit in front of a parole board. After Gerald was convicted of murder, he was allowed to stay a priest, but he was barred from being a part of a ministry. Ohio. Gerald would always say that he was innocent of any wrongdoing. Three years after the trial, Gerald would be given an interview. Gerald had said that he could not believe the testimony that was given leaking him to Sister Margaret's murder. He had also said in an interview that the other prisoners would call him father and would come to him for confession. I can only imagine the kind of confessions that he took in prison. I have done said that Gerald would always say that he was innocent. 
and there were people that believed him. The Ohio Innocent Project would get involved. A new defense team would be created for Gerald. They would still argue that the DNA does not match that of Gerald Robinson. But that was turned down. In 2008, the Ohio Sixth Circuit Court upheld the murder conviction. Also in 2008, the Ohio Supreme Court declined to hear the appeal on Gerald's behalf. All of Gerald's appeals were denied. Gerald's defense team has suggested that the real murderer could have been a serial killer with the last name Watts. This killer was dead. DNA would be tested and the serial killer was not a match. No one had seen a connection between the serial killer and Sister Margaret. A lady named Diane was on the jury at the trial. She said she found the trial, the trial very stressful. She found it hard to believe a priest could kill a nun. She said convicting a priest of murder was the hardest thing she had to do. I bet it was a hard thing to do, considering that there was so much reasonable doubt that he might not be the murderer. At some point in the year of 2014, Gerald Robinson would have a heart attack. He was 76 years old. Gerald would be transferred to the Ohio Correctional Medical Hospital and be put in the hospice unit, which means he did not have long to live. Gerald's lawyers would put a request in that Gerald be released from prison so he could die with his family around him. That request was denied. The next day after the request was denied, July 4th of 2014, 76 year old Reverend Gerald Robinson would die in prison after only serving eight years of a life sentence. He was seven years away from being eligible for parole. A month before dying, Gerald had said to his lawyers, I don't know, maybe this is where the good Lord wanted me to be, in prison for those people. Gerald's death would spark up a couple little protests. The Catholic Church was going to bury Gerald as a priest who was in good standings with the church. A group called SNAP, Survivors Network of Abused Priests, requested that he would not be. Their request was denied by the church. Denied by the church. Now, how many victims do the Catholic Church have that they had to have a survivors network for these abused people? Gerald's funeral, though, would have some restrictions. Gerald's funeral mass would follow this protocol. The funeral could not happen where the crime had taken place. The funeral could not be anywhere the victim attends church. If a minor was involved with the crime, the funeral could not be at a place that is also used as a school. The funeral would be open to the public, but close to the media. The funeral for Gerald Robinson was held at a church in the Polish community near the University of Toledo Scott Park campus. This is near where Gerald had... It was where he celebrated his first Mass after becoming an ordained priest. Four Lucas County Sheriff deputies were placed outside of the church, just in case of a protest, but nothing happened. The funeral had gone on. Reverend Gerald was laid to rest. Could all of this be one big Catholic church cover-up? Could they be covering up someone that is more important than Gerald Robinson? In communities where Catholic churches have a large presence, the church can have a lot of power in these communities, with the bishop holding the most power. Because in these communities, you have judges, educators that are all involved with the Catholic Church. Some say that a priest cannot be arrested in some areas, and that that priest has to be turned over to the bishop to be disciplined. I feel that Gerald Robinson should have never been found guilty with the evidence that was presented at the trial. There is a whole lot of reasonable doubt that says that there could have been another killer. It could have been a patient at the hospital 
It could have been a Catholic student that didn't like how he was treated back when he went to school or something. The Catholic Church historians claim that this is the only documented case of a Catholic priest killing a nun in the church's history. And I say that we know of. I am Bill Swafford and thank you for joining me for this episode of Murderers in Ohio. If you're a true crime junkie, then put your investigative minds to work and listen to Code Ohio to work and listen to Code Ohio. Code Ohio is a true crime podcast hosted by me, Bill Swafford, and I will talk about unsolved homicide cold cases that are from all over the state of Ohio. Join me and put your investigative minds to work and help solve Code Ohio by subscribing now wherever you get your podcast. We got the devil on the road in Ohio.